So Intel just dropped a bunch of new info about their upcoming Alder Lake processors. And uh, there's a lot of stuff, but I'm actually gonna try to break it down into the best possible structure so that it's easy for you guys to understand. So think of this as a follow-up video to what Snows did a few days ago, which you can find right over here. But now with this new info, I'm actually finally able to talk about Alder Lake's exact specs, official pricing, power consumption, and what Intel's claiming about performance. And this might finally be some real competition for a Zen 3, but it could also be too late as well. And let's just also say that by the end of this video, you might probably understand why we're running this particular ad spot. So let's go check it out. The Deepcool AK620 CPU cooler is a dual tower heatsink with six copper heat pipes and an attractive fin array to deliver competitive cooling performance while looking awesome. It's surprisingly quiet at full load, installation is hassle-free, and RAM clearance is flexible if you move the fan. Check out the AK620 down below. All right, so before I get too far into things, I just want to remind everyone that All the Lake is a make it or break it moment for Intel because it represents a very different way to look at how a desktop processor behaves. And if things don't work out, well, upcoming CPU generations will be in trouble as well. Now, Intel's going with a hybrid architecture that uses a combination of high performance and efficient cores to balance workloads and speed up processing times. Basically, the performance cores handle priority loads running in the foreground, like gaming, while the efficient cores take over the background items. Meanwhile, all the other cores can be used at the same time in a heavy multi-core task like rendering. Now look, those E cores might be tuned for efficiency, but they're able to punch way above their weight class because they're able to focus on very specific tasks. According to Intel, they're actually able to deliver the same performance levels as the cores in Intel's 10 gen CPUs. Not only that, but the P cores can boost single thread performance by a massive 28% or 16% over previous generation. One thing to note is the P and E core layout won't be available on every single Arnold Lake processor. So there might eventually be some processors without this design. And speaking of that, let's get right into specs and pricing. But I also want to mention right away that Intel's not talking about their lower end Alder Lake products yet. Uh, the i9, the i7, and the i5 CPUs you see here are all going to be on sale next week on November the 4th alongside the Z690 motherboards and DDR5 modules. So mark that date in your calendars uh, if these new processors interest you. As for the other i5 and i3 processors, well, according to Intel, they will be revealed at a later date, which is actually too bad since everyone here at the office is actually really interested in the budget parts, but uh, I guess time will really tell. Now, starting right at the top of the lineup, we've got the i9-12900K with eight performance cores with hyper-threading enabled, along with eight single-thread E-cores. So it's got a total of 24 processing threads. Then, like you'll see with all these processors, we get into a lot of more complicated specs with the frequencies. So both types of cores operate at different turbo and base frequencies, while Turbo Boost Max is only enabled on the performance cores. So in this case, its range is from 3.2 gigahertz base to 5.2 gigahertz, while the E cores go from 2.4 to 3.9 gigahertz. Now, moving down to the lineup, you'll notice that there's a bunch of KF series processors. And like usual, those are just meant as lower priced options uh, that don't have the integrated GPU cores enabled. Now, from a pricing standpoint, like pretty much everything these days, you are gonna be looking at a premium over previous generations. So while the i9-10900K went for $490 at release and the 11900K went for $540, this one's gonna go for $590 and $565 without the IGP. Competitively, that puts the K and the KF series chips closer to the current price of AMD's Ryzen 9 5900X than it does to the 5950X. So it'll be interesting to see where everything lands, especially since we all know how retailers are going to price these things at a premium. I mean, Newegg, I'm looking at you. Anyways, the i7-12700K series is basically the same layout as the 12900, but with half the amount of E-cores, less cache, and lower P-core frequencies. But check this out. Its base frequencies are much higher than its bigger brother. Now, this thing's actually a whole lot cheaper than the 12900K at between $385 and $410, which is right around the same price as its predecessors. 
technically, it actually competes with the 5800X uh, that you can find anywhere between $410 and $390 these days. But the interesting thing here is that it offers the same number of primary threads as the 5800X, but it also has those four extra efficient cores. And that could be Intel's hidden weapon here. But we'll also only know when we're allowed to publish benchmarks. Then again, there's the i5 12600K. And I think this is going to be the sweet spot for Intel's higher end lineup because it uses six performance cores, so 12 processing threads, along with four efficient ones. Meanwhile, the base clocks get another bump in speed, and the P core turbo rates line up pretty well with the 12700K. The only thing missing is Turbo Boost Max 3.0, but that's actually not going to be a big deal since we hardly ever see. Uh, CPUs running at that level anyways. But pricing is where I think this might really shine, since both models technically hit below $300. But I just really wish Intel stuck to the same $265 prices as the 11600K and the 10600K, but that was just a dream, I guess. Now, provided they're actually available for that price, because that would mean that the Ryzen 5 5600X could be in for some real competition since it's been going around for between $310 or $300 and $310. Now, there are a few common things here as well. All these processors, except for the KF series, use Intel's UHD 770 graphics, which is the same as Intel's XC and 32 execution units as Rocket Lake. So nothing's really changed here other than maybe clock speeds. There's also compatibility with both DDR4 and DDR5, but don't forget that the slots for those memory modules are different. So you'll need either a DDR4 or DDR5 motherboard. Uh, they aren't cross compatible on the same board. Finally, there's the power. And that needs a lot more explanation because it's going to have a very serious impact on everything from temperatures to performance and to the kinds of coolers that you can use on these CPUs. And the whole team here has a bit of an issue with the way Intel's approaching this. Let me explain. You might have noticed the fact that instead of using the usual TDP, there's actually two columns in the chart. One of those is processor base and the other is maximum turbo power. Basically, what Intel's doing is separating the lowest expected stock power consumption from the highest. So far, so good, right? Well, hold on, okay? It's not, it's not over yet. You see, it used to be that turbo or PL2 power rate was only sustained for a few seconds under a multi-core workload. And then the CPU defaulted back to its normal TDP for the remainder of any run. In the case of something like the 11900K, that value was 125 watts. So Intel could label it as a 125 watt TDP CPU. Now, at least on the K series queues, the 125 watt is simply the lowest guarantee operating power rather than the nominal one. These CPUs are now actually designed to run at their maximum turbo rate and power for as long as temperatures and other conditions allow. So for example, the 12900K will technically run at 241 watts all day, every day in Intel stock configuration. That's right, stock. That means the actual values you should be looking at are 240 watts for the 12900 series, 190 watts for the 12700, and for the 12600, well, even that's 150 watts. Now to put that into perspective, it's roughly double, and I mean double, of what AMD's chips are rated for. But we also have to remember that AMD's chips run above their rated TDPs as well, through the use of XFR, just not by so much. So what we're seeing here is Intel pulling out all the stops to compete with AMD. And this time, with Alder Lake or high-end Alder Lake CPUs, they are going to be chugging down a ton of power, produce a hell of a lot of heat, and require higher-end motherboard power delivery to hit their rated speeds. The problem I see is that it will drive up platform costs, and it could cause some shenanigans with how Intel is going to label all the like K series processors on retailers website because I'm going to be honest with you folks these are 125 watt CPUs no way Intel really needs to make that apparent to people who might not be watching these videos so I'm really hoping that we see both power levels listed but you know what I strongly have a feeling that that might not happen since seeing a 240 watt Intel CPU price the same as an AMD option showing just 105 watts would be bad optics right I mean, either way, don't think for a second that your heatsink that's rated for 125 watts is going to be enough for these CPUs because these chips are going to and they're going to need some high end cooling solutions, period. Now, in order to try and manage some of the lava hot heat levels, Intel actually went back to the drawing board for their packaging design. Now, instead of a standard IHS and a standard layer of thermal interface material, 
they're actually going for a thinner, more efficient STEM and a much thicker IHS. That thick IHS is meant to better distribute the coarse heat rather than concentrating it all into one small point. But you might be asking yourselves, what does it actually mean in terms of performance? I mean, as we already know, the performance per watt is gonna be trash can, but will it actually win in benchmarks? Well, Intel actually got some claims here, so let's, let's check it out. You see, starting with gaming performance, and for the most part, we should be seeing a nice little bump versus 11 gen CPUs in almost every single title. Of course, I'm sure those improvements will be a lot better as developers and the Windows scheduler gets more familiar with the new core layout. Meanwhile, against the 5950X, well, things look pretty good. But remember, these are Intel's hand-picked benchmarks they showed us. So until we're able to talk about our own benchmarks, take them with a grain of salt. Also remember that this is against the 5950X, which isn't technically AMD's best gaming CPU right now, at least not in our benchmarks. But you know what? One area where Intel's hybrid architecture should really shine is in parallel creator workflows. What Intel's showing here is editing in Premiere followed by exporting the final video. That exporting process then moves into the background where it's taken over by eCourse and also accelerated by the GPU. Meanwhile, Adobe Lightroom gets open to edit a photo and then the P cores are engaged for that while the efficient C cores keep chugging through the video render. That allows both tasks to finish much, much faster than if they'd be running on a regular processor. I'm actually pretty excited to test this out since this is actually something that I do on a regular basis or a daily basis as I'm rendering videos while making thumbnails at the same time. But even without those parallel workflows, Intel's actually still claiming some pretty big jump in performance over the 11th gen Rocket Lake CPUs. I mean, a lot of that's probably due to the fact that all the lakes got more threads chewing through data, but still, that's the only way to really compete with AMD. In more lightly threaded productivity tasks, the lead is a bit smaller, but it's still there, which is good news for Intel since they really need to up their single threaded performance uh, compared to AMD. The interesting thing here, though, is that they didn't really show any information about creator workflow performance against AMD, and that really makes me wonder why. Now, the last thing I wanna to touch base on is the Z60 chipset and motherboards, because this is the first time in a while where the entire platform is getting a facelift from the ground up. Uh, so it's got new capabilities and they're actually pretty interesting. So first of all, Intel's moved the Alder Lake CPUs to an architecture that supports 16 PCI Gen 5 lanes uh, for add-in cards, while the main NVMe storage slot is still on a x4 Gen 4 link. That actually makes sense since we'll likely see Gen 5 GPUs before widespread availability of storage solutions um, using that interface. Then of course, there's the DDR4 and DDR5 memory compatibility. And I'll say this again, this is not either or solution. So motherboards will support one or the other, not both. But you actually never know, ASRock might have another one of those crazy combination boards uh, on their website sometime soon. It's probably in the works, you never know, but I'm definitely staying, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my eyes open. Basically, higher end and a lot of mid-tier Z60 boards will have DDR5 right out of the gate, while the DDR4 compatibility looks like it's mostly reserved for mid-tier and lower end boards. Now just watch out because like Snows mentioned in his video the other day, tighter timings on faster DDR4 modules could end up beating the DDR5 kits that are gonna be available this year. Moving on, the CPU and chipset are now connected with a Gen 4 DMI link that gives double the bandwidth of previous generations. And there are a lot of other things changed in the chipset as well. First of all, there's now up to 12 separate PCI Gen 4 lanes alongside the usual Gen 3 lanes, and the number of SATA ports have increased by two over Z590. The USB port capabilities are pretty much the same, but uh, the number of available Gen 2x2 ports has been increased by one. But seriously, I mean, barely any boards or external storage devices actually use that interface, even though it's been around for a few years. Maybe that'll change, but as of right now, it just feels like a dead standard. There's also no mention of USB 4, so I'm guessing that's gonna be coming in the next generation. Other than that, the only change is to the Wi-Fi solution that's been moved to Wi-Fi 6E instead of Wi-Fi 6. Now, after talking to a bunch of motherboard manufacturers, uh, it seems like Z690 pricings are gonna look like a lot more like Z590 and X570 boards right now. I mean, sure, there are gonna be some other boards priced to the moon, but um, there are gonna be plenty of affordable options as well. So that's it for now, guys. And I've gotta say, it really feels like Intel's finally waking up and taking the AMD thread seriously. I mean, seriously. It looks like there's a lot of questions and I'm sure there's a lot of concerns about Alder Lake, but, um, 
what we've been seeing so far is actually pretty interesting. I mean, this kind of hybrid architecture could be an exciting new chapter for the desktop market, even if everyone on the teams got a lot of worries about the amount of power that this thing's gonna consume, and of course the heat output as well. But regardless of how you feel about Intel's Auto Lake, it actually looks super competitive. And at this point, competition is good for everyone. So on that note, thank you so much for watching. I hope uh, you were able to take away everything that you needed to know about Alder Lake. Definitely stay tuned for our full review because that one's going to be an exciting one. It probably address all the questions and concerns that you had. And let us know if there's any particular set of tests that you'd like us to run on these new CPUs. I'm Ibor with Hardware Canucks. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll talk to you guys in the next one.